Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Rogue Wave podcast, the frequency for all things pop culture and the disruptors behind it. We talk comics, movies, TV, and pop culture, and the rogues who create them every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern on Facebook.com slash Rogue Wave Podcast. That's wave without the E. Download our podcast immediately. Follow the live stream on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, anywhere podcasts can be found. Search Rogue Wave Podcast without the E or go to RogueWavePodcast.com to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Tonight, Comic-Con at Home recap. New Mutants, Bill and Ted 3. We have a cursed review, and we look at Todd McFarlane, the rogue gallery himself. I am your host, Michael Dolce, as always, joined by my co-host extraordinaire, Mr. Hassan Godwin. How you doing, sir? Uh, oh, that good, huh? <laughs> I don't even know what day it is anymore. What day is it? Is it, is it, it Wednesday? It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. All right. So, um, toying with... Uh, Bumping the start time of this podcast to 9 p.m. Uh, we've got a major announcement coming any day now for the show and, and, and what we've been doing with uh, Going Rogue in general. And I'm thinking 9 p.m. is the way to go. And, and I throw it out to the general audience. Uh, does it matter if it's 8 p.m. or 9 p.m.? 9 p.m. would actually work so much better for me. And so I think we're going to do it. And we're going to time it with a really cool announcement. But Hassan, is 9 p.m. going to be okay with you? I need to make sure you're okay. No. Change it. No? No. We're changing it. (laughs) I know. And that's behind the curtain of Rogue Rogue Wave, where we get to show you exactly how decisions get made here. Yeah. Does it it impact you? Yes. The effed up process of making decisions at Rogue Wave. We're doing it anyway. Well, we will. We'll we'll make the announcement if 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 indeed it happens. But uh, but I think nine p.m. is going to be the way we're going to go. But we'll throw it out there to the to the masses and see uh, if anybody else uh, cares. What we do care about is all the rage in the pop culture world. This segment is called Rogue Rage. Uh, we'll get to the Comic Con at home stuff shortly. But a couple of interesting little news and notes that came out. T- Tenet will release internationally ahead of U.S. debut. Uh, Tenant may still be able to salvage a summer release after all, at least outside of the U.S. Christopher Nolan's sci-fi thriller from Warner Brothers will debut internationally on August 26th before opening in select cities in North America over Labor Day weekend, uh, September 3rd. Nolan is a vocal advocate of movie theaters and has long hoped that Tenant could be a saving grace for cinemas after prolonged shutdowns due to coronavirus. Uh, But it's become increasingly complicated in the U.S. The majority of venues are still closed. Uh, even though theaters will officially reopen just shortly before Labor Day weekend. Uh, Exhibitors have based their timelines to reopen around Tenet and ordering concessions, rehiring employees, and taking steps to become coronavirus compliant is a pricey feat. No one has been rallying in support of theater owners during the pandemic, but they have privately expressed frustrations because they're losing money every time they gear up to resume business, only to have it be pushed back again. We kind of talked about this last week. Yeah. Rock hard place movie theaters, right? Yes. I mean, it's, there's no win in this. I mean, there's no, there's no perfect way to do it. I think sports have reopened. Uh, businesses have reopened. Let theaters reopen uh, along with it. We'll see if there's a response from people. We'll see if people actually want to come out to the theaters. And, but, but at least, you know, just delaying things. I don't know. I didn't think that was helping things at all. No? Yes? I disagree with you, but okay. Well, I mean, in, in what way? Like, how how was it? I'm saying... Is what good is it What good is it to open the doors, right, when you just have to close them again because it, didn't, it turned out to be something that didn't work out? I mean, don't you lose a substantial amount of money either way you do it? And, you know, if you are geared, if you are fixed to be closed for X amount of time and you mm-hmm. adjust yourself to be closed for that m- amount of time, well, that's wouldn't the, you... Um, but that's Wouldn't you be able to sustain yourself a little longer than if you geared yourself to open, spent money to prepare to open, opened, things went disastrously wrong, had to close again, and then had to reassess exactly how to stay closed for the duration of time? Seems like that's an extra expenditure that's not necessary, you know, in the process of a really serious situation that is only respected as a serious situation when a lot of bad things happen. Understood. I actually, 
not getting into the specifics of whether it goes wrong or not, I just wonder if by delaying the the reopening of the theaters as compared to all the other businesses, that theaters just aren't going to be around uh, to reopen. Do you know what I mean? Like it's almost as but if- But I mean, yeah, but I mean, if they, they open- Right, if they can if they open and they become, they become uh, super spreader events, they're, they're not going to be around either. You know, mm. people are, and people are not going to, people are going to very again, blatantly I'm, I'm not, not want to. I'm talking about this from a pandemic's point of view. I'm wondering from a, from a purely economical point of view, if they could make money, uh, then have to close again. I, I don't, I think that, that at least the money they make would then allow them to then reopen again if things get safer down the line, because you at least have made some sort of profit at that point. If you make no profit, which is what's happening right now, and now you have the, the PPP loans and all that stuff, that's pretty much over now. So the government assistant part of it's not there, then th- there's yeah, no this is, of it's not opening at all. Right? This is a discussion of, uh, you know, public safe and healthy. And, and, and but I'm, I'm not having Public that. No, health and safety. Not, that's not the discussion I'm having, right? I actually. Well, I know. I'm, I'm saying this is a discussion purely... of public safety, health and safety versus commerce, right? Which is your angle. And I, not, I, I don't no, no, think no, that. No, I'm not actually talking about that. I'm not actually, we're not having that debate. I'm having the debate of if a, are, if a no. theater can reopen and even if it has to close later by reopening and making some sort of profit, the idea that it can still sustain itself as a business is, is viable versus not opening at all, in which case they may never open is, is the way I'm looking at it. And again, I'm not talking about whether it's going to be a super spreader or it's going to be bad or good or whatever the case is. could very well happen. Uh, but I believe... But how, do you, how do you separate the two? I'm literally just asking that question. I, I, but I mean, why would they have to close? I understand that. Yes, there's there's instances. So then you can't could, separate the could, two. You absolutely you can't can. separate. I'm asking whether or not a theater can. The hypothesis, your right? your hypothetical requires the discussion about it becoming a bad thing that they opened in the first place, right? In order for them to close again. Mm-hmm. So if you're eliminating the hypothetical, you know, if you're eliminating a, a, a huge access of, uh, a point of information for the hypothetical, then we're not really talking about it. I, well, I, I guess don't... my question, my question is, can a theater sustain being closed for indefinitely? Is my is my question? I don't know. I mean, if your theater opens, mm-hmm. and again, it becomes a bad place, you are, your business going to have to deal with the stigma of it being an, uh, an epicenter of, of badness that happened, Doesn't it which could be that, just though? as bad. Doesn't it kind of already have that? I mean, it's, you know. There are no, there are no incidents on record that I know of. they've been closed. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> right, Michael, which means if they open, they could be under heavier scrutiny for right. being a cause of the trouble, right? So there you go. I don't think it's any different than a bar or a restaurant, though, at this point. And those are open. Right. And those yeah. shouldn't be open either. Uh, that's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of I know opinion. that. But you the asked me mine. outdoor. I mean, you know, it's too bad these theater movie theaters can't do, can't pivot to outdoor screening. I mean, that would actually be. That kind of would negate the purpose, though, right? No, not really. I mean, it just, look, no, that's, the, that's what restaurants and bars have had to do to survive, right? They've yeah, but I mean, it would negate the purpose of, of movie theaters. It would negate the theater aspect of movie theaters. I guess so. I guess but there's drive-in theaters, right? Isn't that? There are drive-in theaters. And, you know, if we had, if, if as a, I and mean, if, if, if as a capitalist society, we decided to keep drive-in theaters instead of de- deeming them you know, uh, well, they weren't making money. Yeah, there you go, and that's why they we don't have them. Anything? I mean, the money, that you know, will we the deem band. them non-viable? Yeah. Right? Actually, they're so making a comeback we, now. That's the best part. They're making a comeback. If in anybody innovative would be able to do that, but you know, there's not a lot of people. There's not a lot of those companies pivoting to drive driving. What, what do you de- What do you define as a theater? Like the theater experience. I, I don't want to. What, whatever. Whatever, dude. No, I'm asking. No, I'm asking. Whatever, is, dude. I, why do you, why, why do you always do this? I can't. I can't have a, a like. Take emotion out of it, and just have. I'm not even talking emotionally. I'm saying in in general. I'm not following your narrative on I'm it asking because you I don't a think it's question. a. I know that. 
But your second question is is in conjoined with the first statement about no, whether it's, a second, it's, a, it's a, that's why I called it a separate question. It's the second question. You're 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 asking what you, me what I define as a theater, so that you the could theater you could, experience. Now, what's the so you could wheel back and say that we would still be able to get the theater experience outdoors, even though I said it would negate the theater experience Correct. in the first place. Yes, right. I understand where you're going with that. I'm not getting into it. I think. People go to the movies now, especially people in the metropolitan areas. They go to the movies now to sequester themselves in a place and just to be entertained. There are not a lot of amphitheaters in the middle of a city where you can go and sit down in an outside environment and be blasted a movie. A, B, it would not be viable in a in a social setting in a in a very highly um, metropolitan setting because everybody would be able to watch for free. You get you have oh, people yeah, looking out their windows. And, have, I mean, that's what drive-in theaters are, though. I mean, I, there's drive-in theater. When you have a drive-in in theater, you don't have a lot of drive-in theaters in the city. No, the city, the not, city. Yes. So you're basically just your entire perspective is wrapped around where you live, but not the rest of the country. The rest of the country could pull that off. I mean, again, Why isn't the rest of the country doing it? Well, because they have nothing really to show. I mean, that's the thing. They keep pushing these 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 uh, tentpole movies that people think will get them out. I'd say to- if you found out that these movies were coming out, that would be the wrong time to start constructing your alternative viewing experience. You'd have yeah. to be in the process of building them now so that yeah. when the movies come out, you'd be able to, And if they were smart, they'd be doing that yeah. so that once the movies open, they could, they, could, they could push business. You had a drive-through that was open and bustling, and everybody could stay in the safety of their own cars and watch movies yeah right then i think that would be highly successful because people are ready for it but no one's doing that so yeah not many places are doing well it's tough i mean like you said it's 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 tough but just throwing it out there all right Mm, a couple of little little tidbits tom holland's third spider-man film delayed to december 2021 paramount announced it's delaying a quiet place part two and tom cruise's top gun till 2021 as well uh, switching over, cutting to this, Emmy nominations, 2020 are in. Surprise, surprise, Watchmen, the highest honored show, 26 nominations. Mandalorian, honored for, uh, nominated for Best Drama Series. Thoughts on pop culture shows getting into the Emmys. Is this simply because there's nothing else on? Uh, no. Or is the why would, of why work, would that be? Is the quality of work d- uh, demanding this? It, well, because it's very, very rare that any kind of academy honors pop culture shows. Oh, like Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones is, is a good exception. Very yeah, Game of Thrones, that. Boardwalk Empire. Boardwalk um, Empire is not pop culture. Boardwalk Empire is like Sopranos. That's pop culture. What do you what do you define as pop culture? Comic book related material, stuff that's that's adapted from. That's not a definition of pop culture. All right, then I'm going to go. Popular culture related. is is the definition of pop culture. Graphic novel related content. Oh my god! Then specify that. Oh, I just <laughs> did. You would think that after two hundred no to- uh, no shows of doing this, you, you no you I I still I use the English language, you not Dolce language. <laughs> One of these days, you will you will actually study our wheelhouse. Right, it's me. Like, I understand. Oh, hey, did you know that we kind of only cover stuff that has been adapted into a comic book or is adapted oh from a comic Oh, my God. You didn't even know that the, 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 the extraction was You <laughs> was didn't either, comic book. my man. You I didn't did care. Not I'm, I'm just saying you. You're the one who's pushing hawk in the language, I know, right? I know. No, you I didn't mean, even that know. That was a big fail on my part because I, re- I really liked that movie, too. I thought it was cool. It was a lot of fun. Well, there's your review. <laughs> done and done. There you go. Done and done. All right. Comic Con. There's nothing but I mean the boys, you know. There's there's a bunch of movies that are there are a bunch of movies and TV shows that have been given Emmy nominations. So I mean, I don't I don't see what your I don't see what your statement is. I wasn't surprised by Watchmen. I was a little surprised by Mandalorian. Generally, a Star Wars show, a, a Star Wars spinoff, right? I mean, doesn't necessarily get. It became popular. It was a. It was. It was yeah, highly regarded. Not equal like recognition. And most of the Mandalorian was before the the shutdown. Yeah. So it it's not even you. It's not even an exception to the rule. You know, it it it, it got it 
in the merits of uh, existing with all the other existing pop culture right. of the time, since there was uh, there was no shortage at that time. Yeah. So, I think it it kind of got what it it earned, right? I, it's it, it's def- I'm I'm curious to to know. Uh, which I don't have right at my fingertips right now, what it's going up against in terms of the best series out there. Um, I mm. think streaming obviously makes it more difficult to narrow down to a very select group of things that you can actually honor as well too. I think that's, I think that's kind of difficult. So I actually give it even more props and kudos for rising to the top of whatever mm. that series list is. So, okay. But I was surprised to see Mandalorian there. I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't lie. Um, I thought it was good. I just. I mean, it's a Star Wars show. You know what I mean? I think there's there's something. Watch Watchmen was making a statement. You know, in our hyper political times, making right? a statement before the politics actually caught up with it. So again. Oh yeah, that's true. I, I agree with that as well too. So again, you know, I don't. I don't see. I don't. This this particular. Uh, era we're living in really doesn't have anything to do with any of that stuff at the what do you mean you know because all that stuff was before this you know it wasn't none of these things were done in a consolation for right. the circumstances we are living in today right so they all all the all the the uh garnered applause that they've earned they earned them uh, legitimately yeah i agree with, oh no yeah no see that's what i'm saying watchmen i wasn't surprised i was actually i was like i was like you know what that that makes sense like i i could totally see it uh you know whether you liked it or didn't like it we liked it uh it was it was really well done and again has a lot of relevance to today's society i thought i thought that makes sense to me mandalorian okay. i was i was pleasantly surprised i guess i don't know something about think about a star wars spinoff that it's not as if it was a really deep show. It's not as if it really spoke in, in many deep ways. It was fun. It was kind of entertaining every week. But, you know, generally when you have like best drama series, Game of Thrones is so deep and so layered. The characters go deep. The, ca- the, the plot lines go deep. The execution of it. The, I mean, it's, it's Game of Thrones, I would, I would say, is, is considerably superior to something like the Mandalorian, even though I enjoyed Mandalorian, but again, in terms of Emmy noms, I was, I was a little bit shocked. I was a little bit surprised. I don't know. That's, Fair just, enough. Me. That's just me. You're very talkative yeah. today. I like, I like you. You're very, you're very, uh, very alert and aware here today. All right. Comic-Con at home recap. Yes, that was a sarcastic jab at you because you, you generally not, Give me a, give me much here, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Brian K. Vaughn's Paper Girls scores an Amazon series order. That was pretty cool. Paper Girls is an amazing series. It was thirty issues long. It was published by Image I've Comics. Never read it. Never you read should. it. That is a that I is should a read high it. recommendation. Yes, absolutely should. Now I won't read it. <laughs> I know. Amazon has given an early third season renewal to the boys, and the boys panel was one of the talked about virtual at homes. But the big takeaways. Well, you um, you were, you were a fan of the boys, right? I loved. You I thought it was it? awesome. Yeah, I, I was really. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a That's lot. Good news for you for then. I did. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, look. It doesn't mean that next season's going to be good. Doesn't mean third season's going to be good. Doesn't mean any of these things. But I really enjoyed it. I thought it was. Yeah, but really I mean, cool you know, it's take. good news. It, it's good news to know you're getting more. You know, yeah. of something that you enjoyed. Yeah, I no, I I, uh, I definitely enjoyed it, and I definitely am looking forward to season two. Uh, I might do what I did with Doom Patrol and go back and purchase the Omnibus. Um, yeah, I mean, because I w- I want to be able to kind of read it <laughs> and see it all, mm-hmm. uh, and see what the comparisons are. But as far as the show goes, very very uh, excited by it. Very much like Walking Dead for me. I wasn't, you know, I knew of the comic. It didn't move me when the comic came out. I've read the comic of Walking Dead, and, and then I watched the show, and I was like, wow, this is actually far superior to the comic book adaption, or the, the comic book itself that it was adapting. Oh, so, one of the first people to say that, that I've heard. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, Kirkman, Kirkman's very good at creating characters and having interesting plot lines to where you kind of want to see what happens next. So I give him, I give him from a serialized standpoint, he's a very good writer. He's not great when it comes to comic book writing though. He dumps information. He dumps things in massive expository dialogue, at least in walking dead. 
Uh, his X Men run too wasn't, you know, uh, nothing to write home about. Invincible wow. supposedly is amazing, and I need to, I need to, I need to read that. So, hey, I got a, I got a lot of things to read, and uh, and I'm excited about that. You got all this time. Right. Well, I wouldn't call it time, but I definitely have a thirst because we're limiting our external activities these days. So I have, uh, gotcha. I have a void. I have a void. To Understood. Fill. The big, Understood. the two big things from Comic Con at home. Bill and Ted Three, which will do the trailer Truth the Trash next week for the for their trailer. Mm. Um, just briefly, the trailer looked a lot better than the teaser that they released. At least it it, it didn't make me sad, so that was good. <laughs> um, they're doing something different though. They're doing video on demand the same day they release in theaters. Good. I, I kind of don't understand why Tenant isn't doing that. Yes, you do. Why money? No one. Uh, there's once you release it onto video on demand, it's going to be instantly pirated, right? So whatever you know, if you if you uh, yeah, but if you, you financially back the movie that was supposed to come out and be a financial, you know, with under the auspices of being a financial powerhouse, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But from a from a powerhouse director who's had a lot of franchises, you know, go gold right. um, under his two under his guidance, right? Yeah then you're going to want your maximum return on that. So like to, to compromise it by putting it out on a streaming service or something like that. And it's the, therefore perhaps diluting the, uh, the revenue stream you could be making off of it. But I think the pirating thing is an issue if you release it overseas first too. Uh, that's my point. The release, it's, but it's I mean, not it, it's, as if... It's not, it's not the same. If you digitize it and you put it on digital streaming, it will mm-hmm. be pirated. It will be a very, very good, a 10... A 1080p, you know, version of it oh, is uh, potentially pirated, as that's opposed true. to cam or you know yeah. something else. A lot of uh, which is compromised viewing, as far as yeah. a lot of people are concerned. That's true. In which right, case, I give you that. All right, that makes sense then, because I was worried about the pirating aspect to Tenet as well too, and I couldn't understand why the two didn't, you know, kind of do the same. But I'm excited because we get to watch Bill and Ted three. I'm also excited because New Mutants is apparently coming. I am like super excited for this movie. They do that should have been trailer. streamed. That's going to be in movie. That theaters should August be on 28th. Disney Plus. Yeah, but it's going to be on August 28th. Actually, it probably end up being on Hulu when all is said and done because they're worried about the you know the brand overlap of something that's supposedly horror R rated. But I mean, hopefully it's on Disney Plus because I get that. Well, I got Hulu too, so whatever. I just pay for it all. <laughs> why not? Yeah. Okay. Point, at this point, yes. we, don't, we don't go out and do stuff. So, no, nobody does. I don't even money. know what outside is like anymore. To spend on, um, I see people outside, you know, through the window, and I'm like, oh my god. No, outdoors is great. See, I'm outdoors. Nah, we don't go out. Tons of outdoors. There's no so outdoors. I'm not like going anywhere and doing stuff outdoors. That's where I'm. That's where I'm not. Uh, the really recent new trailer that was the big buzz about Comic Con at home. Uh. Josh Boone, the director, talked about how he wanted to make this a trilogy. Warlock was going to be in the second installment of New Mutants. Okay. I also think, in general... In the second installment, that's a... <laughs> theoretically, right. would be that's... out this year as well. Because it was supposed to be out in 2016. It would have been out last year, actually. Did they make they that already and it's on the shelf somewhere? That's if the... they had actually decided to release this at all, which they did <laughs> it would have been out last year. That is ambitious. Holy yeah. crap. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. So, so yeah, it's really funny. Um, new trailer looked pretty cool. And they actually also released the opening sequence. Did you have a chance to watch the opening sequence? With the um, I did trailer? not see the opening sequence. I see, I've seen the new trailers. I did not watch yeah. the new. Sequence. Yeah. The first two minutes was released. You can watch it. Uh, it and again, looked pretty cool. Uh, it, it, it looks as if it's based on the Sienkiewicz, uh Claremont run, you know, in spirit yeah. anyway, you know, not necessarily an execution. No, it won't be. And we it are at be. such a devoid of content, of, of feature film content. I can't wait for this to be released a week later on VOD. It was not officially announced it would be released a week later. But it'll be released a week later. Or it'll be released, a few, you know. I mean, to the point where we're Relative not going to go to the theaters soon. to watch it. I don't, I don't even know a theater that's open by me anyway to go see it. I can wait for it to come on VOD, but when it does, be super stoked. Like when it's on Disney Plus, super stoked. I think I think 
in this particular case, don't you think it's kind of a mistake for Disney not to do the VOD thing? Um, like simultaneously, yes. kind of like Bill. And that's Ted. what I. That's that's exactly what I said. It should. It, they shouldn't release it in the theaters at all. Yeah. Every every company should be should be looking into investing to in, to enhance the home theater experience, right? So yeah. at least that they can have some kind of. Um, at least they have some kind of agency and some kind of industry that they, that's been devised for. Because look, the, the society's going that way. Movies are movie theaters are going to be phased out. They're going to be special events. It's going to be like plays and concerts now. You know, like going to the movies is going to be like super special specialized events. Right. Theoretically, right? Not not in the next twenty years. Not not five years from now. But you know. You know, the the most uh, optim- optimistic appraisal of that is probably maybe in about 20 years. We're not yeah. going to have movie theaters anymore to the extent that we have them now. Mm-hmm. Every one of those uh, companies, just like the comic book discussion we had uh, with DC and uh, Diamond, DC Marvel, uh, Image and Diamond. Yeah. They should be innovating ways of being able to capitalize on the home theater experience. Right. right? Um, television industries, I mean, excuse me, um, uh, electronics industries like Sony and, and all, you know, they're, they're already, they're already doing what they can to invent, to, to mimic the home theater experience with their, with their devices. You can right. watch HD on your television. You can watch HD on your, on your digital devices now. Yeah. You can watch movies. So, so the home theater experience the uncompromised home theater experience is not that far away, you know, like a, like a true genuine um, in-house experience is, is very close. So these industries should be innovating ways that they could still make the same amount of money that they make, you know, and also studios, they can make the money directly without having to go through distribution uh, uh, outlets like movie theaters where they don't really share too much of the proceeds from the movies, but they do have to share some of it because I know movie theaters don't actually make very much money on the movies that they show. They make money off of uh, the, the attendances and concession stands and, right. you know, that kind of thing. So I, I know that the, the studios do not suffer huge hits of, uh, you know, uh, of their right. returns um, from movie theaters in and of itself. But, you could you could now cut out the middleman completely and just all that money comes straight to you right yeah um and it'll be good because look with all these streaming services coming out there there's this bubble's going to burst because everybody's throwing lots of money Did at any Apple property TV. they could get their hands on you know yeah apple tv is now going to be investing in feature films though cuz the greyhound movie they said was one of the was their big like hit the, the did you movie. see that movie it's a great movie uh, no, but you know what's movie. funny? Uh, I just got a new Mac, and I got a, f- a year's free of Apple TV, so I will go see it now. Uh, I literally got it this, this week, so. Okay. I got a, a Yeah, free... it's, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I hear, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at it. And, and I, I got to tell you, I would look forward to seeing an awesome feature film from a streaming service as opposed to kind of like what we've been getting from Netflix in terms of feature films. You know, like Old Guard... <laughs> isn't exactly high art uh you know extraction was a lot of fun wasn't exactly high art uh you did have roma though i think which which obviously uh netted a bunch of uh of oscars so uh there is precedent for for high art yeah uh but this and the, and the uh, could actually be the the resurgence the of the scorsese movie you know i didn't watch it but did get but, I mean, it, it got awards. It was yeah, award-winning. Right. Yeah. No, you're right. I, but I'm, I'm wondering if these streaming services are going to bring back that middle-budget movie. Hopefully. Where, you know, theaters right now, they can't show these movies because the tentpole is the only thing that actually bring people to theaters. The Marvel movies, the DC movies, the comic book movies, things like that. The big event movies, Mission Impossible, you know, things like that. And these really cheap horror movies... People like going out to see horror movies. It's an experience. Uh, cheap comedies, very cheap comedies. Kind of dying a little bit, to be honest with you. Those, those, those comedies you could watch at home over and over again. 
We don't see those in theaters, but you definitely don't see like the $50 million, $100 million original screenplay anymore. Everything is adapted. Everything has to have an audience built in to, to make people go out to a theater. But now with these streaming services, now hopefully, you know, we will get to see, you know, those movies. We were, I mean, we were just fortunate enough, if you think about it, to grow up in the, the 80s and 90s when a studio would invest, you know, $50 million into an unknown director, an unknown story, an unknown script. Uh, or I won't even say 50 million because obviously for inflation and whatnot. Uh, I remember American Pie, the, guy, uh, the guys who did that walked into the theater and said, we're going to make you a, we're going to make you a movie. It's going to cost you $11 million to make. It's going to make you a hundred million dollars. And that's exactly what it did because it was, it was cheap to make back then. And it made a hundred million. It was a, it, it, it was a tentpole comedy for that summer. You're going to hopefully see the resurgence of that. I think, I think I would love to see something, you know, discovering extraction was based on a graphic novel actually made me sad. Cause I was like, wow, this is great. Somebody actually made an original, you know, yeah, thought, an original screenplay, but I was wrong. I was wrong. Who knew? Who knew? But you... What? Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> no, I enjoyed the. I enjoyed the film. But I mean, you just said you wished. You wish you knew it was a. Well, I knew it for our purposes. Yes. Oh man. All right. Okay. All right. For our purposes, it would have been great. Look, one one way or another, people are going to innovate entertainment, and we're just going to find other you know, other parameters, other, you know, other categories of, of entertainment that, you know, middling, I mean, it's, un, it's unfair to call them middling, but, um, you know, middle range movies, mid-range. not non tentpole movies. We're middling. Those budgets are mid range. Non tentpole movies are, you know, I mean, they are very prevalent on streaming services or whatever. It just depends. You now have to go find them. I know. As opposed to them, them being a- available or, you know, you getting, uh, you getting a buzz from word of mouth. Right. You know, uh, you know that kind of thing. So, and then there's articles sometimes. But, you know, articles, articles are just as greedy as uh, as movie theaters. They're only yeah. going to gravitate on the temple. So right. you actually have to go seek out your middling movies. Yeah. You know, unless I mean, we don't we don't watch cable like we used to. Like you know, you, some some days on a Saturday or a Sunday or something like that, you used to just put HBO or Showtime on. And just leave it on all day while you go about your business. And sure. then strange movies would just come out of the ether, you know, and then you would discover them that way. It doesn't happen that way anymore. No. We, we, we set out to yeah. view one of these channels with a purpose. Like, I right. want to see this one show. I want to see this one movie. And then I'm out of there. You know, I got other things to watch. So, I mean, you know, that material still exists. But you just have to be diligent and, and find it. It's just like right. music. You know, right. music of today, you've got to find new music. Yep. You know, new know. music is not going to be brought to you. I don't like that. So. I don't like that at all. Well, yeah, we come from the, that era that we were lucky, you know, where all the, all, the, all the innovative things, all the new things, you know, all the catch things were brought right to us, you know, yep. or, or made a, we were made aware of them. It's not like that anymore, unfortunately. No, and I, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not condescending about it. You know, I'm not, I'm not happy about it. I'm not like, well, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. It, it is a loss, but yeah. I mean, that is the, the damn way the that, cookie crumbled. <laughs> speaking of that era, in this segment, know. this is the Rogues Gallery. It's our first ever Rogues Gallery segment uh, where we spotlight the visionaries and true rogues in the pop culture universe. Today's spotlight is on Todd McFarlane. Did you catch the documentary? On sci-fi, uh, it debuted Comic-Con at home. Well, it didn't debut Comic-Con at home, but it debuted Comic-Con weekend on Sci-Fi Network. It was an hour-long documentary. <clears throat> it was all about Todd McFarlane and his journey uh, into being this, I mean, just, I mean, by its very definition, a rogue, right? Like, guy who just did it his own way. Mm. couple interesting points from it. Well, it, I, you know, I don't know if you saw it, but I did. No. It I was great. did not. Wait I didn't know we were going to review it. So yeah, because we said it last week and we did talk about it but anyway uh, we did. <laughs> the couple things from the documentary that i thought were really really good one it shows just how todd mcfarlane and you probably know some of this so it's not like you're you're learning anything new right when he got into marvel first of all he had like 300 like 500 rejection letters he has like a, a suitcase of like three to five hundred rejection letters <clears throat> and he talks about how he finally got his chance over at dc and then the book got can- or then uh, then the book got canceled, but then he ended up getting put on another book. Um, and then when he moved over to Marvel, 
Incredible Hulk was a was a flagging book. Uh, and he ended up getting put on Incredible Hulk. But throughout his entire career, people kept telling him, don't do, too cartoony. Anatomy's not good enough. Need to do figure drawing. Need to do this and this and this. And his mentality was <clears throat> kind of like the 90s itself, right? The 90s music structure. You know, down, 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 big. Down, 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 big. He's like, if I could get you to be excited, you know, I could lull you into a, a false sense. Like a couple panels won't be that exciting. And then I can hit you with a really exciting panel. You know, that's what you're going to take away. You're going to, it's almost like a hook, like a chorus line of a song. Um, but again, it was just really funny. You know, he literally said the way we do things at Marvel is boring. Uh, that, that, that was what he was told. <laughs> it was essentially, we are going to, you know, we are traditional. Don't draw Spider-Man's yeah. eyes big. Don't do this. Don't do that. And every time he, he'd be like, okay. And then he would do it anyway. And then they would publish the books and sales would go up. And he said, that was what I always wanted to do. He says, in the early 80s, or the late 80s, early 90s, Spider-Man titles were actually falling. Like the sales were down. So he walked into Spider-Man's office and says, I want to do Spider-Man. And they gave it to him. And don't draw his eyes big. And don't, you know, you can't make the webbing the way you make, you know, the way he did his web, the webbing, like just the way he did his webbing. Uh, yeah. Which is iconic when you think of Todd McFarlane the big the two things you think of big spider-man eyes and and you know i, I want to call it real webbing because and, i actually crazy contortionist uh, poses that spider-man would be in he's cra- he's like he's always contorted right. like in these crazy right. poses right and, and and i'm looking at a at a john ramita senior spider-man that i have up on the wall and the webbing is like literal webbing but how do you hold on to it you know uh, mcfarland's webbing had physical it looked like it was strength to it you know yeah, it was like it was like power cables it. it looked like he was shooting power cables out of his hand the other thing i thought was interesting was when he was talking about they moved him he, you know he wanted to write and so they gave him his own spider-man book it sold like two million copies something something ridiculous right yeah and i remember that i mean that cover's iconic right it just jumps jumps off the you know and it's such a simple cover right it's just him crouched in a web in like a sea of webbing it's, it's amazing and they, he says, you know, I take this title, I make it all, I, I take it all the way from the dumps to like number one to at the time, the all time best selling Spider-Man book. And I was still getting notes too dark. You know, could you, could you be more of like the traditional Spider-Man? And they had an interview with Mark Silvestri to kind of go along with it. And Mark's like, yeah, they didn't like that. They wanted Spider-Man to be what everyone was talking about, not Todd McFarlane. And that's when he decided to go form Image Comics. So that kind of insight was kind of cool. It's not exactly stuff I, that was new to me, uh, but to hear yeah. it straight from McFarlane, hear it straight from like some of the other Image creators. Uh, he actually also said he happened to run into Jim Lee. Jim Lee happened to be at the Marvel offices the same day that he kind of made his decision to go start his own, <laughs> his own company. And he pulled him aside and was like, hey, come with me. And Jim's like, yeah, if it wasn't Todd McFarlane, I wouldn't have done it. Like I wouldn't have left. I would have stayed on X-Men. Uh, which also made me sad because his X-Men was amazing. Out of all of the Image Comics guys, save for maybe Eric Larson, he made the most iconic book. Um, I give credit to Jim Lee for Wildcats. I give credit to Mark Sylvester. I give credit to Jim Valentino. I give credit to all these guys for creating their own works. Uh, but in terms of what has really stuck, you have Savage Dragon from a comic book standpoint and you have Spawn. And that's it. Uh, I, Wildcats keeps reinventing itself. So it has stuck as a concept. Yeah. But not as yeah. an not as the original, you know. Execution. Yeah, and all those other ones like Cyber Force and right, you know that they, they all Wet kind Wars. of fell by the wayside. Yeah, uh, Shadowhawk tried to re you know uh, uh, revamp itself about ten years ago, eleven years ago. Uh, I actually pitched t- uh, to do that book. Uh, it was it was interesting, um, but yeah, Spawn Spawn is actually still stuck around, and he's going to do the movie he's going to direct the new movie i'm excited i'm excited in that sense so from a documentary standpoint i i don't know it was just okay like i i remember watching you know even just watching like the toys that made us yeah there was a certain gravitas to it whereas on sci-fi i feel like i don't know there was there was some manufactured drama they were like working up to like issue 300 and you know each segment was basically like four weeks away three weeks away two weeks away one week away kind of like all right. 
it, it, I don't know. There was something about it that, you know, it was just okay. Like I remember watching this going, I kind of expected more, but getting a couple of little tidbits into it, I thought was pretty interesting. And obviously it's good to get this information now. I mean, oh, it's, it's good to hear them, you know, the creators talking about themselves and their experience and stuff like yeah. that, because it gives you insight to your own journeys and, you know, your yeah, own desires. It gives you inspiration too. I mean, it yeah. basically he sat there and said, you know, my dad was one of the hardest working blue collar guys around. He was an amazing dad and he was amazing in general. He was, I wanted to be just like him, except I never wanted to be told what to do. And I thought that was pretty awesome. You know, and I thought that was a pretty insightful you know, narrative that obviously I wouldn't get uh, if I hadn't watched it. So that was our Rogues Gallery Spotlight on Todd McFarlane. True innovator, true rogue. Uh, we'll get more maybe, we'll do him maybe down the line. We're going to bring in a couple other pop culture guys uh, and gals along the way. And we'll do a little spotlight and feature these guys and, uh, and gals to, uh, to let you guys know, you know, who are the guys making the stuff. You know, real rogues, real people kind of going against the grain. All right, when we come back, another rogue, Frank Miller, has had one of his comic book series adapted into a Netflix show. Is it worth watching? We go yay, nay, or may when we come back. Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast, the frequency for all things pop culture and the disruptors behind it. We talk comics, movies, TV, and pop culture every week. Go to roguewavepodcast.com without the E, and you can check out our podcast on all major podcasting apps. Okay, we have just gotten a a, a flurry of new series based on comic books, um, which is the wheelhouse that we are. Just to let you know, again, the wheelhouse, anything that's been adapted or adapted into a comic book, fair game for the most part. For the most part. We, we stray sometimes, but cartoons, animation, that falls into our wheelhouse. Anything that's, that's kind of, you know, we're not, we're not reviewing Citizen Kane anytime soon. Put it that way. New show on Netflix, Cursed. Um, it's based off of a Tom Wheeler, Frank Miller book. It incorporates a lot of Frank Miller's artwork into it kind of revamps the Arthurian legend. It's kind of a, uh, a, a, a new telling, a new spin on it. Uh, features a lot of diversity in it. Features a female lead. Kind of has the making, all the markings of the traditional Arthur, uh, you know, Arthur storyline. It has, actually has Arthur in there, which is great. Uh, it has Merlin in there. Kind of has this um, uh, Christian, you know, Christian group that's that's out there as the villains uh, it, it's interesting i mean it's definitely a very interesting retelling of the story i threw this out on facebook is it worth watching past episode two that's basically kind of where a lot of folks are saying two episodes couldn't make it through this is this is the buzz that i was hearing about it right warrior nun got really high marks in terms of just you know, what I was reading on Twitter and social media. This show had a lot of people turned off by it. It had a lot of people saying, no, 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 it's worth it. You got to get through it. It's slow. I actually didn't find it to be slow. But the question is, is it worth going past two episodes in your, in your opinion? Oh, that's, that's a question you're asking me? Yes, because you're the only one here. I know, but you were, you said you had put the question out there. Oh, it's a fake. So yes, you, I did. But now, yeah. I'm so not. you started the. Okay. Um, is it worth going past the first two episodes? Yeah. Yeah. So the first two episodes give you enough to say, "I really want to see where this goes." I'd say so. Yeah, it did. I actually say yes too, and I'm a little I'm a little surprised. We threw it out there. Um, friend of the show, Mike Martz, Aftershock Comics, he gave it a meh. Yeah. Uh, Mike Watson, uh, artist, said really wasn't worth it. Um, then you have people like uh, uh, like Tia Fabi, who's been on our show before as well, too. And she was, she's like, I love this series. Now, it's interesting, too, having the female lead in a King Arthur remake, essentially, 
Now, mind you, it's literally an alternate what if. Like, what if, you know, instead of picking the king, you know, the sword picked a queen. It's right? not a what if. What do you mean? It's not a what if. She's what not if? the queen. She's not going to be the queen of England. Well, you don't know. She's going to be the lady in the lake. Oh, prequel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, but their tagline, their their whole Netflix like promotional. The the tagline the tagline in the film in the the show itself said before there was a king, there was a queen. Correct. So it doesn't say instead of a king there's a queen. It just says before Arthur there was this person. See, now that's where it gets really confusing though, too, because there is an Arthur. There's an actual Arthur. Well, well he hasn't he's not king yet. Yeah, but he was only king because he pulls the sword out. But meanwhile, he's holding the sword. No, 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 no. That's that's not quite the legend. What's the legend? Well, okay. The sword that she's wielding, theoretically, is Excalibur. Correct. You're talking about him pulling Excalibur out of the stone. Correct. The sword he pulls out of the stone is not Excalibur. Not, no? Not in traditional legend. It is in sometimes they mix the two together. The, the legend I'm aware of is this guy was a nobody. The sword appears. A whole mm-hmm. bunch of people try to pull it out. Whoever pulls mm-hmm. it out is going to be king. He pulls it out. Boom. He's King Arthur. That's, that's how I understand the traditional. Right. Television. That's not quite. It, the sword isn't Excalibur, though. Oh, Same okay. story, but it's not always Excalibur. It's another sword. Um, but I can't I remember. Like the, I know the, I know the, the French version of, which is, which is basically what most people know, the French version of uh, mm-hmm. King Arthur. Because King Arthur, the, the entire story is French. It's actually not English. Hmm. So the traditional story, that's why Lancelot is a, is a big deal. Lancelot's supposed to right. be French. It's like, you know, so it's about this, you know, most of the story is about this amazing French knight right. that went over to England and, you know, showed everybody how to be awesome. Um, however, it is not often, it is, it is often now, they, 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 uh, man, I can't, uh, they condense the story so yeah. that the, they're not two, two magic swords. Cause you know, we're, you know, we're all confused and we're, we're too simplistic of people. So I was like, why not make Excalibur? Right? It does. It, it, it makes sense in, if you're trying to condense it. Yeah. No, no, it makes you know? sense from just a, from a storytelling aspect. It's, it's no, like, if you're in a fantasy universe, if you're in a fantasy realm, there are many fantasy uh, elements in there, sure. right? There, are, there are many, there are many tasks, there are many quests. So removing the sword, removing a sword from a stone, and then and then eventually becoming the person who wields another sword. That's not that hard. That's not that confusing. I guess, yeah. <laughs> so anyway. So it's not always it's it's not always Excalibur is right. what I'm saying. Okay. So that Arthur in that in that show, yeah, pretty much is because his sister is Morgan, or Morgan Le Fay, right? Whose sister in the in the and uh, <laughs> she and she took the name Egraine, which I don't know why, um, which is basically Arthur's mother. Okay. So and and Pendragon Uther Pendragon is typically Arthur's father. Sometimes, and sometimes he's just the king that came first. You know what I'm so, realizing? You have an extensive knowledge on Arthur, his, Arthurian history. Uh, no, it is not extensive enough because I cannot tell you the name of the original sword. And I oh, cannot, wow. you know. I didn't even know there was um, an original sword. It should be Excalibur. See? <laughs> that was the original sword. See, you're okay. ready. Maybe there that's isn't fair. a second sword. You're just trying to. You're, that's your MacGuffin that you're using to like. I I, I swear to, to you, to I'm sh- to show your authority on this subject. That's basically what I do in anything. I just throw extra swords in there and just tell yeah, you, Mike, you're wrong. There's another I sword. See why yeah. You wouldn't. yeah, yeah. Well, that's and you know what? If I hadn't done that before, that's what I'm going to do from now on. I'm just throwing I swords. You should. In. All right. That's that's. You the seem plan. very. <laughs> you seem. It's a great story. You were a kid. You didn't. You know. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't sword and stone all over the place where you were a kid. You didn't run around, you know, nailing people with a stick and saying, I've destroyed you with Excalibur. And you're, and you're a dragon today, and then you chase your friend, and he falls and breaks his arm on a rock, and, you know, and you, and you, you beat him with the stick anyway, and you say you've conquered him, and then you go home, and then you get in trouble. Yeah. That never happened to you? You never did that? 
I mean, I played with swords. Yeah, I mean, we we, we <laughs> do that, but you never you never beat your. Friend we would only with... use Excalibur. It wasn't a second All right. sword. Right, right. There's no second sword. All right, understood. Let me throw this one more question out to you right now. So I, I so sure. I was uh, I was perusing because that's what I do uh, in preparation for the show, and I found this right. article on CBR. Cursed oh, raises the bar for diversity in fantasy, but it mm. could be higher. Here we By go. Hannah Collins. Uh, Cursed doesn't assume... Let the record show now you are bringing this up into the yes. discussion. I, okay. Yes, I clearly am. Cursed mm. doesn't eschew all the issues of fantasy race generation, but its diverse casting and inclusive characterization still set a high watermark. My question to you is, how much more diverse can a show possibly be before it, it gets the award for, like, or, or, or like passes the mustard test, according to critics? No, I don't know. Why would you ask me? I'm legitimately asking you what is. It's not. I mean, but it's that's not my. I don't know. How would I know that? How much female more? lead? Yeah, you have a. You have. Um, so what does the article African say? American Why does the article say it doesn't? It doesn't. You have Merlin make a, queer. Um, all of those are the main you don't central know if characters. He's queer. He was in love with. Uh, he was in love with Imwe's mother. So I mean, that's no, not, I know, but there's. I guess uh, you didn't are, watch the whole show. That's the problem. no, I didn't. I, I asked if I get past the second episode. That was the that was the question. Should I go past I the second episode? I did. I, I actually started the third. You should you should watch the whole show then. Okay, perhaps. well, I guess Merlin. But, I don't think is. I don't think he qualifies as queer. But go ahead. Who is it? Is it is it Morgan Lefay then? Is is it? Yes. Okay, she's the one that. Sorry. So my my apologies. I didn't. I didn't. Merlin is not a typical masculine character. Is my point? I guess. Let's let's put it. He that never way. was though. When has Merlin ever been masculine? No, I know he's not. I'm just I'm merely saying that that they have they've they've okay. hit all the notes in terms of what uh, people would want for in a diverse show. I don't understand what more it could possibly. What does the article say? Why does the article say it hasn't done it? And then maybe I can comment on that. But I don't know. You're you're asking me blindly whether it's enough or what's enough or you know what is enough and what is not enough. I I have no idea. Though Curse you know? is built as Nimue's story, Igraine is actually the chief architect of its feminist infrastructure. Uh, there are a lot of men around Nimue, uh, trying to, Nimue, Nimue trying to pull her left, right, and center and tell her what she should do and how she should use the sword and what it should be. And it's important, I think, that Igraine is definitely ahead of her time in a sense. They call it the sword of the first kings, and she's kind of the first person that says, why can't it be you? Um, here we go. It's something... You know, she goes on to say in the article, Curse has far trickier waters to navigate, however, in the depiction of its oppressed fantasy race, the Fae. Using fictional peoples as stand-ins for real-world marginalized groups is often described as the mutant metaphor, named after Marvel's X-Men, who were conceptualized to echo the civil rights movement. As many have pointed out, this metaphor fails when the actual people it refers to aren't visibly or adequately represented by it. So the Fae weren't diverse enough to be create, to, to be considered the marginalized group. Doesn't that kind of escape the idea of a metaphor at that point? Like once you once you're like hitting the nail on the head, aren't you kind of like isn't that like a erasing the metaphor part of it? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's it's um I do agree with it to an extent whereas the X-Men are supposed to be a, a you know a metaphor for an oppressed group, right? Mm-hmm. Especially like an American oppressed group and then both uh that that uh, the the analogy of Xavier being Martin Luther King and then uh, uh, Magneto being Malcolm X, right? Right. But they're all white. You know, everybody's white. You know, there's a, sure. And then you know, except for Storm and and, and Nightcrawler, Bishop. whatever the heck Nightcrawler is, even though he's German, but Bishop. he's blue. Huh? Bishop. It's Bishop. Twenty years later, oh, you know, like counts. Thirty years ago now. Chew on that. Chew on that uh, amount of time that has gone by now. Do you I don't want mean me to that answer the question or not. Like, I don't mean that the point head. of our discussion. I just mean it was thirty years ago, and that's really scary to me. Go ahead. Anyway, um, so I understand that point, but I mean, I understand your point also. That's why, you know, the article is. I don't. I don't know if you want to. I. I what is enough? If your question, your question is kind of ridiculous because I don't know what enough is. Well, enough. no, 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 no. I'm not saying enough. This... I almost, I'm just wondering. I'm watching this thoroughly, diversely casted show. Mm. Um, it, that you no... didn't watch. 
Well, I, <laughs> no, I did. I watched the first two and a half episodes. I said, do I go past episode two? I went to three. That was my, that was my lit- litmus test. <laughs> I was busy watching the McFarlane documentary while, <laughs> while you were watching The Cursed. Um, right. I'm watching this and I'm, I'm, enjoying, I'm enjoying it. Like, I'm absolutely enjoying it. I'm enjoying the, the retelling. I'm enjoying that there's, you know, it's kind of a different spin on the Arthurian legacy and, and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it has, again, a, a very diverse cast. It has lots of representation. Um, and it's not getting in the way of the story in any way, shape, or form. It, the story is just, you know, it's just being presented to itself. And then I read an article like this, and I'm just like, I don't understand. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but that's that's a person. That's that person's opinion. And you know, and some of the points that she brings up, which you 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 haven't really highlighted all that much. So we can only we can only go on what little that you've read of the article in and of itself. Some of the points she highlighted are valid points. It's just like, does is it? Is it our, is it uh, Curse's responsibility to do those things? I don't know. That's a, you know, it's, it's, if you believe that Curse has that responsibility and they're not ref- fulfilling their responsibility to do those things, then your obligation is to not watch Curse. That's all. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Um, those things, the, those tropes are correct. They're, they're questionable. You know, the, the representation of uh, marginalized people, you know, mm. usually put in the positions of power, which is also very strange, you know, where you'll get mutants. Mutants are an impressed people, but, you know, you got dudes who can fire lasers out of their sure. eyes, you right. know, and who, who live hundreds of years and heal instantly. That's a different it's, metaphor. That's a different discussion. You know, why would mutants be feared and like the Avengers not be feared? You know, like things like that are, are exactly. That is, that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate, uh, I think argument. Um, I think well, the whole, yeah, to- the whole, the whole analogy in and of itself, it's a, <laughs> it's a cool, it's a cool story element, right? If you want to start a story element and usually science fiction and fantasy are used as metaphorical, right. you know, you know, material to or allegorical material to comment on the modern age or whatever. So yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, in the this this age of cancel culture and whatever, we're probably going to end up slipping away from that yeah. because now any concession you tr- you try to make into making your your fantasy story and applying or inclus uh, your level of inclusiveness is going to come under scrutiny or whatever. Your capacity for allegory is going to is going to diminish. You're not going to want to make statements. You're not going to want right. to, you know, address certain things. So, I mean, we're, we're probably coming out of that phase where science fiction and fantasy are, you know, exploratory uh, pieces of uh, fiction to, to look into, uh, you know, the, the process of human self-examination or whatever. But, you know, pertaining to Cursed, <laughs> I think the problem is the execution, you know? I really... The, they 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 don't have a diversity problem in curse, you know. They've got a they've got a attempting to do high fantasy with a low fantasy budget kind of problem. Yeah, in curse. I thought it was you know yeah. that's I thought it was beautifully shot too. Yeah, I, as it I goes on, you impressed. if you if you'd watched more, you'd I was see impressed. because well they start they, they they continuously try to build or capitalize on the 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 ground that they made, you know. And some things are really good. There's some I mean you understand the stakes and you understand the circumstances very quickly. It's not, there's not a lot of confusing stuff. There's a lot of characters and they're not, they're not all uh, two dimensional and they're not right. all congealed. It's not all, you know, okay, that's fine. But then there's, there's other, there's, there's, there's streaming tropes that the show does a lot. First of okay. all, it's low budget trying oh, to be I high you. budget. Yeah. You know, it's, it starts with a question and then ends not answering the question. Gotcha. Okay. And with with the with the prevailing overarching dialogue season two, and everything. baby, you got to be there for season two. Yeah, and it's ridiculous. It is ah. really ridiculous, and they didn't do enough, in my opinion. If you want an actual uh, yeah. uh, review right. of the show, they did not do enough. I just like that you woke to, up now. That's good. They didn't do enough to ensure your your questions are dumb. You ask better <laughs> questions, and I'll, I'll answer. I'll answer more okay. vibrantly. All right, huh? real quick. Yay, no. You, you didn't that. even stop or, or, and let me review it. You, you cut me off to make a bad joke as in the midst of my review. It was not, I say that was not a May. joke at all. That I was say an observation. No, it was that was an observation. Bad. Yeah, yay, a bad one. Meh. I said meh. You said meh. <laughs> Move on. I go yay. You can't yay. You don't even know. You didn't even know Merlin wasn't gay. You, you have no idea what you're I talking about. I didn't say about. he was gay. I said he was queer. Big difference. Mm. Oh, my God. Big difference. 
All right. When we come back, we go spinning the racks. I need a new show. Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast, talking comics, movies, TV, and pop culture every Wednesday night, facebook.com slash Rogue Wave podcast without the E. We are big fanboys of comics and graphic novels, and every week we like to bring you the inside info on the source material that will make its way onto large and small screens. We call this segment Spinning the Racks. Spin the rack, spin the rack. Comic-Con at home, a success for comics. Uh, just like the non-virtual comic First Comic-Con. of all, wait a minute. That's terrible. What? That's terrible. What? The fact that Comic-Con at home is a success for Comic-Con. <laughs> no, for comics. That's, yes. For comics. But uh, that, is it more successful than a Comic-Con? <sighs> this is from the beat. Just like uh, in the non-virtual Comic-Con, the Monday after was a re- relatively quiet day for the comics industry. But the media has spoken, declaring the event a bust. According to data from social media analytics, listen first, tweets that mentioned Comic-Con at home were down 95% from 2019's live convention. Um, Tweets about the top 10 TV events were similarly down 93%, and top five movie panels were down a shocking 99%. 93%, holy, 99%. They were down 99%. (laughs) There was 1% of... Of buzz? Yes. That, oh, my God. Well, part of this, look, part of this was the fact that there were no movies coming out. So the, the top five movie panels, I could understand, would be down. Yeah, that's not going to go too far. It's not going to go too That's 93%. Far. There's also, I guess there's TV out now, but, you know, in terms of what's coming up, not, not there. Right. Um, and they said just 93,000 tweets over the five-day event against 1,719,000 tweets. I can't believe I actually pronounce the number correctly in 2019 so yeah it, it's down i mean that's a, that's a significant amount 93,000 down, down gets 1.7 million i mean it's definitely bad uh views on youtube which hosted the vast majority of comic-con panels were scarcely better average views for thursday which have had the longest period for people to watch them are hovering around 15,000 per panel on one hand that's over double the capacity for comic-con's live venue on the other hand it's still down significantly from the actual live event. The numbers for comic-based panels, though, are way, way up above what they would have reached in person. The Eisner videos alone had 16,000 views, uh, which is about five... <laughs> I'd estimate that about 500, 800 people attend in person. Right? Hmm. So 16,000 okay. compared to 500 people. Yeah. Other comics-based panels uh, would have been in the hundreds uh, or even... Uh, wait, other comic-based panels have viewerships in the hundreds or even thousands something that only a few superstar DC or Marvel panels would have achieved in person. Even the Klingon lifestyle panel had 2,700 views. I guarantee that is more exposure than in years past. Uh, Well, nothing can replace the in-person experience. Uh, The virtual con allowed people to go browse many individuals with online stores, and some of the tweets uh, indicated brisk sales. Definitely something to investigate further. Uh, Zack Snyder, the article does mention this from Heidi McDonald, Again, from Comics Beat, Zack Snyder actually pulled off a live panel at a spinoff event called Justice Con and inter- interacted with viewers. Um, but pulling off a virtual event on a few months' notice for an organization that specialized in real-world events was quite a task. So basically, very good for the comic book industry if you, if you look at the numbers. And it's true, right? I mean, the comic books aspect to Comic-Con completely, completely overlooked these days. I mean, it's basically a Hollywood you know, showcase. Um, yeah, I can see that. I could, I could see your point on that. You know, so um, having, you know, Tom Brevoort talking about Empire, you know, um, which is the big Marvel crossover. Yeah. Um, was it Swords of Ten is the big X-Men crossover where Jonathan Hickman likes to use the word X as 10. Uh, they, that, you know, those panels received actually more bump than they normally would have gotten. It's good to gauge, though. It's good to use this as a gauge of actual interactivity with the with the event, as opposed to um, San Diego being the event itself. In which yeah. case, you don't exactly know how many attendants came specifically for, 
you know, the, the, the wear that you're hawking, right? Yeah. Now, also, because it's virtual, it allows people who wouldn't have bothered to go to a panel because it was too much hassle, there's too much people, right. people there, there's, you know, the room is too crowded or they're too busy doing something else, right. you know, to be able to attend, that actually gets you more scrutiny, you know, than you might get yeah. being at the event. But there's I, nothing that's going to really beat the visceral nature of being no, there, present. No, right, exactly. You know? I mean, meet and greets are, are amazing. I mean, the New Mutants panel was the biggest buzz of the whole I think which is just wild isn't that just crazy <laughs> which isn't is that crazy reason why I don't understand why they don't do the video on you know the problem with like, this you're movie never is gonna this, movie get, is... this is not gonna ever be hotter than now <laughs> the movie is going to it's, it's not gonna live up to all this even if it's a great movie I have nothing I have nothing against the movie I disagree I do not, actually I disagree it's not gonna live up to all this you're going to see the movie and you're going to be like, oh, all right. That's, I think people well, are so I'm, content starved right now. New Mutants is going to be. I didn't say that people wouldn't watch. That no, it no, I think they're going to enjoy it. I, I'm telling you, people are enjoying like Old Guard. Like it's the greatest thing that's ever been made. And I'm like, it's really not. It's okay. Like it's okay. So I kind of okay, feel like. You so. I feel like New Mutants is going to be. I don't know. Even if it's like not. As long as it's not horrible, it's going to be revered as like, that was awesome. Because because my eyes needed something just so because. desperately <laughs> to watch for two hours that it it, it just okay that's fair. fair I enough. just I don't know I feel like I feel like people are gonna be like this was great oh my god like it's gonna it's almost like a um like something like a nostalgic romp like remember when we used to go watch X Men movies and Marvel movies like <laughs> oh I got that feeling back again it, was, it feels like it was a year ago that we, that that we did time. these I mean, it's gonna be two years. I mean, two I years when all of a sudden. I didn't, say, I mean, I didn't say it wasn't a realistic uh, thing. Black Widow's not going to be hit until November now, if that. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just, I can't understand why they wouldn't just do the VOD. I, maybe, maybe they're, maybe they're trying to save face with the theater associations, you know, and not, and not trying to. I told though, you it was money. Didn't we, we had this discussion in the earlier uh, so. segment. But it's not like, this was one of those movies that was already in the can. Um, and purchased as part of like the big deal. That's my point. It's not like they invested. So was Black money. Widow. So was uh, you know. So was Tenet. Everything was in the can. Everything was ready to go. No, but I'm saying Marvel didn't actually invest their money into this. They bought Fox, and it was already it was already made at that point. So I feel like well, then this, they paid for it. I guess so, but I I feel like it's a little different. I feel like this movie, just because of its its strange journey to the big screen, is a little bit of an anomaly in that, I mean, it, could you think of a better movie to go to on demand the same day as you release in theaters? No, I can't, I can't, I don't even know why they don't, it's not on demand now. I mean, Hamilton, you know, was supposed to be in theaters and they moved that up, you know, and they actually, um, they, you know. <clears throat> I, uh, okay. I, I mean, I don't disagree with you. I know. I just, you know, I don't know what you want to, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it is what it is. People want a lot of money. You know, you're going to have to pay those people back. Like if you paid me, mm-hmm. um, you pay me like $60,000, right? In order yeah. for me to, to do a, a, a really high end, uh, YouTube video or whatever. And I, yeah. I use the money and I put together this video and just about just at the time as I'm about to, uh, to drop it, you know, something happens with the, the platform, something changes, the venue changes or whatever. And so now there is a less, um, substantial uh, platform that we could post the video on that will reach probably um, less than a quarter of the audience that you might have really you might have re- uh, reached via YouTube. The money that we don't get from that, I'd end up having to pay you back. You know, the sure. the, the, the return on that investment being substantially low depending on what kind of insurance i sign with you that you know it, it, acts of god or whatever whatever kind of cataclysm came in and uh, you know stole our opportunity to make the maximum return on on our investment right right if i was smart enough to do any of those with you then i'd be okay but if i couldn't or if by so i owe you that money you know so like let's say that um you know nolan made various promises about how this thing is successful or the studio itself put a lot of revenue behind it, hoping that it was going to lead into an entirely new 
shared universe or some kind of effort that uh, they were going to make. Yes, yeah. You know, it's it's a. I mean, it's more to it than just movies, right? Like this, that Ford Fairlane line, or it's a, that the, that Wayne Newton said. There's more to the music industry than just making music, you know. So yeah, you know, it's it's it is just the way it is. It's more to the movie industry, man. And just just hanging out, watching popcorn, and watching uh, you know Chris Evans put the smackdown on a uh, uh, Josh Brolin. You know, there's there's way more in movies than that. Well, I guess so. I guess, but all right. Well, we will see it, and it'll be on demand quite quite quickly. I would imagine. I can't yes, imagine. your prediction. Your prediction is in hand. Sure right? to go wrong. So, if your prediction is yes, your prediction sure to go wrong. That's your that's your insurance policy right there. Yes. So when it doesn't, you can say, I, I told you it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> jam-packed show next week. We've actually been blessed, uh, amazingly, with jam-packed shows lately, which is, which is great. Uh, mm. We got Umbrella Academy Season 2 dropping Friday, so we'll dive into Season 2. We'll give you a little retro review of Season 1. Trailer Shoot the Trash, Bill and Ted 3, the latest trailer. And we are going to be joined by Kari Andrews, the acclaimed writer and artist in Spider-Man Rain. Uh, he's got a new movie out with Tom Berenger. He's got two of his actors coming on board. Uh, it's the latest addition to the spy uh, discography. So he was the director on that. Um, he's awesome. He's super opinionated. going to be a lot of fun. We'll see you next week. Rogue Wave.